thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to give a talk. So thank you very much. And then that's always a pleasure to be here in Siam. So um, first I apologize because uh, what I, I will talk about is not exactly in the theme of the conference. So I hope it won't be too boring for everyone. I will talk about small sunsets and actually the title written on the, the slide is not a very good one, because I shouldn't say continuous versus discrete setting, actually. It's more collaboration than a competition, as often in my field, that's what works. So, um, I will begin with uh, explaining what a sum set is. So, I take two sets A and B in a group G, and I define A plus B. Uh, of course, my group is a commutative group. Um, okay. Um, so, I will be interested in two questions. The first one is how small can A plus B be compared to the size of A and the size of B? And if A plus B is close to its smallest possible value, what can be said about the structure of A, the structure of B, and the structure of A plus B? And I will be interested in two different contexts. The first one is the discrete context in which I will uh, study uh, sets, sub, some sets in Z and in, in Z over NZ, I shall say, say ZN. Um, and in the continuous setting where uh, we will study subsets of uh, R and subset of T, which is uh, R over Z. And uh, I will try to focus on some different tools that uh, will be recurrent in the proofs. The first tool is the discretization. It will allow us to transfer some properties from the discrete setting to the continuous one. A modular reduction, which will allow us to transfer some properties to T, from T to R and from Z over NZ to Z. And also rectification, which will allow us to transfer some properties from R to T or for from Z to uh, Z over NZ. So let's begin with the first lower bound in the Z and R, which are really easy uh, bounds. Uh, so if you take A and B a subset of Z, for example, and if you assume uh, by translation invariance, you can always assume that the minimum of the sets is zero, then you have a set A, which is in red, a set B, which is in blue, and if you come, if you look at the set A plus B, you have at least A, because zero is in B, so A is included in A plus B, and you also have D plus B, because D is in A, so D plus B is included in A plus B. And that gives you, gives you the first law bond, which is that the, the size of A plus B is at least the size of A <coughs> plus the size of B minus one. Uh, I forgot to say that I take some finite sets. And uh, the minus one is due to the fact that D is counted twice if you don't... Uh, yeah. Sorry, what is D? Uh, D is the maximal uh, value of A. It's written... No, 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 here? Here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so you can have equality in this inequality. In case A and B are both progressions, arithmetic progressions of the same difference, and uh, you have exactly the same phenomenon if you work in R rather than in Z. So you can do the same thing and you have that the size of A plus B is at least the size of A plus the size of B. Here I'm working with the inner Lebesgue measure, meaning that uh, that's the Lebesgue measure of the, I mean the supremum of the Lebesgue measure of closed sets which are included in the set. And the reason why I'm working with the inner Lebesgue measure instead of the Lebesgue measure is that if not, you may have some problem uh, with measurability of the sets. So uh, to avoid these kind of problems, I always work with inner uh, measures. And uh, you can also have inequality in R if uh, A and B are subsets of intervals and have full 
measure in these intervals. So these are really the first basic law of bounds. And we may ask if these law of bounds also work in Z over NZ and in uh, the torus, in uh, R, R uh, over Z. So let's begin with uh, Z over NZ, and actually let's begin with uh, an N which is prime, so we work in ZP. And if you take two sets A and B in ZP, um, and P is a prime number, then the size of A plus B is at least the minimum of the sum of the size of A and the size of B, uh, minus 1 and P. So it works almost the same as uh, in uh, integers, except that uh, you cannot have more than P elements in any subset of ZP, so you, have, you must have this minimum here. So here I'm using the counting measure on ZP. And the proof is quite uh, easy, actually. It's proved by induction on, on the size of B. I give a sketch of the proof because some of the ideas are used later in uh, some of the theorems. So, uh, you always assume that zero is in B, and if uh, the size of B is one, then it's easy. So, you can uh, assume that the size of B is at least two. And there's a first case uh, where the size of A plus B is exactly the same as the size of A. And uh, in this case, then you introduce the subgroup H, which is the subgroup under which, I mean, the groups of elements under which A is invariant. And um, since this is a subgroup of ZP and P is prime, it must be either zero or ZP. And it cannot be zero because B is included in H, and so it has to be ZP, and it gives uh, this Lao bond here with the, the P. Okay? And if you're not in this case, then we will use uh, an induc uh, the, the induction, and so we will try to um, find some sets A prime and B prime, such that B prime is uh, uh, of size uh, lower than the size of, uh, of um, smaller than the size of B. So, um, we define this set, so maybe with the picture it's easier. So you have a set A here, and you pick up an element A0, such that there are some elements in B, for example this one, such that if you had A0, you're not in A. Okay? So these two elements here, if you add A0, you don't uh, go into A. Okay? So um, then you define A prime and B prime, in A prime, you add all the elements um, that you would have if uh, you added that plus A0, so this, this one and this one, and the elements of A, which are the other ones. And in B prime, you uh, just erase the two elements that uh, uh, you had here. Okay? And uh, what you want is that the size of A prime plus the size of B prime is the same as the size of A plus the size of B which is okay because you have here two disjoint sets, so it works, and B, B naught is included in B, in B so uh, you have this equality. And you also want that, so that if you have a Lao bound for the size of A prime plus B prime, it gives you an a Lao bound for the size of A plus B. And to have that, uh, if you take an element here, it's easy to see that it works, and if you take an element here, it's slightly more difficult because, okay, you take an element in B prime, and because of the definition of B naught, it means that A0 plus this element is in A. So you have A0 plus this element which is in A, and since B0 is included in B, then you have the sum which is in A plus B. Okay, so you have that, and this kind of transformation uh, are very often used in uh, additive combinatorics. So, uh, this gives you a Cauchy Davenport theorem if you use the re recurrence hypothesis. Okay, so now what happens if P is not prime? If you're working in Zn rather than in Zp, do we have the same uh, property, the same Lao bond? Uh, actually, no because if you take any subset, uh, non-trivial subset of Zn, 
then uh, the size of A plus A is the same as the size of A, so you cannot expect anything like uh, cauchy davenport's theorem. But you have uh, something which is uh, also a very strong theorem, which is Knesser's theorem, and which says that uh, given two subsets A and B of Zn, uh, the size of A plus B is at least the minimum of the size of, oops, sorry, the size of uh, A plus H. I don't see my red point. Here, okay. The size of A plus H plus the size of B plus H minus the size of H and N as usual. Okay, and here H is the set of elements under which um, A plus B in, is invariant. So again, you see this kind of uh, subgroups which arise in, in additive combinatorics quite often. Uh, I won't explain the proof of Knesser's theorem. There's a, um, three inductions, an, indu an induction on the size of A plus B, uh, a descending uh, induction on the size of A plus the size of B, and a third induction on the size of B, so I won't explain it now. Uh, but this is a result that we shall use later, and that's the reason why I say it here. Okay, so now what happens in the continuous setting? Do we have something like Cauchy-Davenport's theorem or something like Knesser's theorem? And actually, we have the analog of Cauchy-Davenport's theorem. This is a result uh, from, um, uh, by Rykov. If A and B are subsets of the torus, then uh, the measure of A plus B is at least the minimum of the measure of A plus the measure of B uh, and 1. Okay, so here I'm working again with uh, inner measure and that's the inner uh, measure that's, okay, that's the Lebesgue measure on the torus, Lebesgue measure modulo 1. So the proof is uh, also, I mean, uses some tools that we will see also later, so I give a very short sketch of the proof. So first thing, instead of working with A, oh, okay, I, I give the proof for A equal B. And most of the time I will all, always give a proof for A equal B. So uh, if you take, uh, okay, instead of working with A, you will take something which is uh, more smooth, another set which is smoother. And uh, so you define this set uh, A eta, which is an approximation of A, but smoother one. And then you take uh, two elements, u and v, so maybe if I show the picture, it will be easier. Okay, so you have a. First thing, you cut it into p pieces. And then you take an element u, such that you have many elements of the form u plus k over p here, in a. Okay, so for example, you take this u, and all the points are the points of the form u plus k over p, which are in a. And you take an approximation of A, smoother. Uh, uh, when I say smoother, I'm, I should say simpler. It's a finite union of intervals. And you do the same thing for this approximation. Here it's not a very good approximation because P is very small and one half is not very close to one. But if you take something which is close to one and some large P, then it, this begins to be a good approximation of A. And you do the same thing with A. And now, if you take an integer k2 such that k2 is in B tilde, B tilde is the set of k such that uh, we have that. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, B tilde is defined. I cannot use that. Here, okay. So if you take k2 in B tilde, then by definition, it means that you have V plus k2 divided by p, which is in a eta. And by definition of a eta, it means that you have this low bound for the measure. So this is what I wrote here. And if you take k2, uh, k1, sorry, in a tilde, then it means that this cannot be empty. And so you have for uh, an element k, which is sum of an element of a tilde and b tilde, you have that, okay? And a tilde, <laughs> Uh, and B tilde have uh, a low bound for this size, 
And so you can use Cauchy Davenport theorem for A tilde and B tilde. It gives you a low bound for the um, size of uh, the sum, A tilde plus B tilde. And because of that, it gives you a low bound for the size of uh, A plus B, uh, A, A plus A. Sorry. Okay? So, now uh, we, we have some uh, um, results in uh, the torus, and uh, we would like to see what it can be give in real numbers. And actually, we know that uh, um, Rykoff's theorem is sharp, not Rykoff, but uh, okay, that the size of A plus B, at least the size of A plus the size of B, can be sharp if you have intervals. But you can have something uh, sharper, and that's what uh, Rouge approved. It proved that if you have two subsets of the real numbers, uh, and if you define the diameter of A as the supremum of A minus its infinimum, uh, and if you assume that the measure of A is at least the measure of B, then the measure of A plus B is at least the minimum of uh, the measure of A plus two times the measure of B, and the diameter of A plus uh, the measure of B. It means that in case you have something as an interval, you can win lambda of b. Okay? So um, I shall explain the proof in a few minutes. And uh, I just give here an example of a set for which uh, this low bound is sharp and which is not an interval, because uh, we already saw for intervals. So you see, uh, you have a zero, and then you have a small interval, and then uh, you have uh, uh, two times the first point here, and two times the, I mean, this set here is this set plus itself, okay? And again, you increase the size, and on the other way, it works the same. It means that you have here a small interval, and then a big one, and, uh, and uh, if you uh, look at the sum, of this set plus itself, it gives you that, that, this interval also, and then a very large interval, which will stop here, and then the small one, and again one. So you have exactly the lower bound. Okay, and uh, last year I, I got a result which uh, is uh, mostly based on Rouja's work, so, uh, and I proved this theorem, which is a kind of a continuous analog of the 3k minus 4 theorem by Freiman, that I shall uh, state uh, in a few, few uh, slides. And um, okay, let's take this. Okay, let's say that A is equal to B. It's easier to understand in uh, in this setting. That this theorem says that uh, if A is equal to B, and if lambda of A plus B is strictly less than three times lambda of A, then a is included in an interval of size at most lambda of A plus A minus lambda of A, and we see why this is included by Rouge as a result quite easily. And uh, the, new, the really new thing which uh, was not known is that uh, there exists an interval uh, included in A plus B of uh, size at least lambda of A plus lambda of B. So, um, I will start uh, by the explanation of uh, Rouge's proof. So only in the case A equal B. There are some technical uh, problems if uh, this is not the case, but uh, the main ide ideas are in this proof. So. so we will use modular reduction, meaning that uh, we define the diameter of A. As usual, I assume that the minimum of A is zero. and um, I also assume that A is closed. Still, I'm working with the inner Lebesgue measure. It's not a big deal. And, uh, okay, I will do, okay, with the picture, it's easy to, easier to understand. If A plus A has this form here, so you have 0D, D to D, and I put it this way so that it's easier to understand. Instead of counting the measure of that plus the measure of that, the measure of that, and etc., I just say that uh, the sum of, I mean, the measure of A plus A is the sum of the measure of this set in red and this set in blue. So the red set is the um, union of projections 
of uh, the set A plus A modulo D. So it's A plus A modulo D, okay? And this set is the intersection. It means that it's the set of X in zero D such that X is in A plus A and X plus D is also in A plus A, okay? So we have equality between the measure of A plus A and the measure of S1 and the measure of S2. And the good thing is that now we can work modulo D. And so we can use the results we have modulo D, uh, especially Rykoff's theorem. So first thing that oops, yeah, we should uh, observe is that uh, zero and D are elements of A, since A is supposed to be closed. And so it means that A modulo D is included in S2, because if you take an element A in A, then a plus zero is in A plus A, and A plus D is also in A plus A, okay? So we have that, S2 contains A, and we also have that uh, by uh, Rykoff's theorem, which is we scaled for, for this problem. So we, we have that the measure of S1 is at least the minimum of D and two times the measure of A, okay? And gives you, it gives you exactly Rouge's theorem. So the idea is if A is not equal to B are about the same. Okay, so um, now if we, okay, maybe I have to go back here. Uh, if we assume that, that uh, the measure of A plus A is strictly less than three times the measure of A, it means that the measure of S1 must be D. So S1 must be everything, okay? And it also means that the measure of D is strictly less than the measure of, uh, no, is less than the measure of A plus A minus the measure of A, and this is strictly less than two times lambda of A, okay? So in this case, if you assume that lambda of A plus A is strictly less than three times lambda of A, you have these two things. And now, uh, the third thing I want to prove is that, I mean, the third item of uh, the theorem was that A plus A must contain a large interval. And to prove that, I introduced a function G, which is two times the measure of A intersected with zero X. <laughs> and uh, we have that if G of X is strictly larger than X, then X is in A plus A. This is quite easy to understand. If you take an element X, if it's not in A plus A, it means that for any Y which is less than X, either Y is not in A or X minus Y is not in A. And it gives you this result. And the other uh, property here is obtained by symmetry. So you have that, and G is a good function. It's positive, it's continuous, it's two Lipschitz, and it's increasing. And we have G of zero, which is zero, and G of D, which is two times the uh, measure of A. And we define two, uh, three areas, Z1, Z2, and Z3. Uh, so the first one will be the X for which G of X is less than X, then G of X between X and X plus delta, and then G of X larger than X plus delta. And because of what we said here, oops, the properties, <laughs> The properties of G, sorry. Uh, we have that uh, Z2 union Z3 union D plus Z1 union D plus Z2 are subsets of A plus A. Okay? So if you have a function G of this shape, then we know that G of zero is zero. We know that G of D is two times lambda of A. Okay? So you draw the first line which is y equal x, the first one is y equal x plus delta. If you're under this first line, I mean, under the second line, then uh, d plus x is in uh, a plus a. And if you're uh, above the first line, then x is in a plus a. So if you have this kind of shape, it means that all this interval here must be in A plus A. And so you prove the theorem. You just have to prove that uh, Z2 is not too small, but here you have uh, 
uh, a white which is delta and you have a two Lipschitz function so it means that here you have at least delta for the size of Z2. Okay? And uh, the problem is that you may not have this kind of function, you may have something which crossed the line many times. And in this case, it means that at some point you must cross from Z3 to Z1. But this cannot be possible if lambda of A plus A is strictly less than three times lambda of A. And the reason for that is that, as we said before, lambda of A plus A is larger than the mu of S1, which is D, plus mu of S2. And S2 contains A and Z2. So you have this inequality here, and it has to be less than three times lambda of A. But if you look at this um, crossing, down crossing from Z3 to Z1, then you must have here at least uh, the measure of Z2 intersected with the complementary of A has to be at least delta. And it would lead to something which is not, uh, uh, I mean, which contradicts uh, this uh, inequality here. So it ends the proof. And now uh, I want to say that uh, actually this kind of results already existed in the discrete setting. But uh, the proof is quite complicated in the discrete setting. Uh, and I'm not sure that people had in mind this uh, graphical interpretation. And uh, with the graph, it's much easier to understand because actually the third consequence here that you have uh, uh, an arithmetic progression which is included in the sum works exactly the same in the discrete and in the continuous setting. If you have the graph in mind, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, but there are some real uh, complications in the discrete setting. One is that it's more messy because a point has a measure in the discrete setting, and that can be messy. That's why you have this uh, minus three here, and plus one, minus one, and all this stuff. But there's also a, a more complicated argument, is that uh, if you have diameters which are prime numbers, then everything works as in the continuous setting. Instead of using Rykoff's theorem, you use um, uh, Cauchy Davenport. Okay? But if uh, the diameters are not prime numbers, then you cannot use uh, Cauchy Davenport and you have to use Knesset. And then you have to work modulo uh, the uh, subset H that we talked about. Yes? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what the et is, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> et is and, and PGCD is GCD. Sorry, that's my French way. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's what I said. So I won't say more about the proof. Okay. So now we also have some, uh, with the graphical interpretation, we also have some free results, uh, which is that uh, uh, actually if you know that the delta we used before, uh, in case A equal B, it's two lambda of A minus the diameter of A. If it's strictly positive, then you can say something about the structure of A plus B when you know uh, the size of A plus B. And instead of uh, spending more time on, on the, the um, uh, statement of the theorem, which are quite hard to, to understand at, at first glance, uh, okay, I, I just, I, I'll give you the, the graphical interpretation so that you'll understand exactly what happens. But before I would like to uh, uh, emphasize the fact that uh, the, the, this theorem in the discrete setting did not exist and uh, it was proved by Paul Perringuet, who was working uh, uh, as a master student under my uh, supervision. So, yeah, and he's here. So. <laughs> um, so, why do we know anything about the structure of A plus B in the, if delta is positive? It's just because, as we said, if we are under this line here, then it means that if you add D, then uh, and no, it means that you are in A plus A, and if you have, if you are, ah, oh, sorry. Okay, 
again. If you are under this line here, the second one, it means that if you had D, you're in A plus A. And if you have, are above this one, it means that uh, you are in A plus A. And so it depends on how, on how many times you cross the line. But each, one, each, each time you cross the line, you have to add delta to the size of A plus B. So if you have an upper bound for the size of A plus B, it means that you cannot cross too many times the two lines. And it gives you a result on the structure of A plus B. It's a small result, but uh, still, it, it say, says something. OK, so now we may wonder if this theorem in R and Z can be translated in the torus and uh, in Z over PZ. And the reason, I mean, the, the, the answer is partially yes. There's a result by Sarah and Zemmour, which says that uh, if you have a subset of ZP, and if the size of A plus A is smaller than the size of 2 plus epsilon times the size of A, uh, usually if A is not too small or too large, you also have that if you have the first one. So the, the really important one is this one. So if you have a doubling constant, which is less than 2 plus epsilon with a very small epsilon, then you have that there exists an integer n such that n a is included in i. And again, you have the same bound for the size of the interval. It's the size of a plus a minus the size of a plus 1. Okay? So that's the same thing as in z, except that it's not a which is included in the interval. It's n a. Okay? n a modulo 1, or modulo, modulo p, sorry, here. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have a generalized result of this uh, form by green Kravich in case uh, A is not equal to B. And uh, um, it's, uh, I mean, the, generalis the generalization by green Kravich uh, also gives a structure of uh, A plus B as we had in the 3K minus 4 theorem in Z. And the uh, proof uses the isoperimetric uh, method. And uh, with uh, Pablo Candela, we proved that uh, we have the same result uh, in the torus. And again, what we use is discretization. So I just give a, a short uh, sketch of the proof. So first, instead of working with any A, we work with uh, A which are finite unions of uh, open intervals. Okay? We can always approximate uh, sets by that, so we work with that. And then we discretize uh, our set A by introducing this set, this set AP. So this is a subset of ZP. And uh, we can prove that uh, the doubling constant of this subset AP is small. And so we can apply Serra and Zemmour result or Grinkevich result, whatever. And we get uh, um, the existence of an integer n such that n a p is a subset of an interval uh, i p. And uh, we can translate that uh, for a. Because of the definition of a p, it means that n a is a subset of an interval i with mu of i, which is about mu of a plus a minus mu of a, which we want, plus that. And the problem is that we have no control on n. And so we need to control this uh, integer n. And to do that, we use Fourier analysis. And uh, we prove that n is bounded in terms of m, with a, a bound which will depend on the number of intervals in the set. And to do that, we prove that uh, if we have a subset of zp of density delta, which such that n times this subset is included in a small interval, then the Fourier coefficient of the characteristic function of d in n is rather la large. Okay? And on the other side, if you take a subset which is a finite union of intervals and of m intervals, then we have that the Fourier coefficient cannot be too large. And because of these two things, it gives us a an upper bound for n. And once we have an upper bound for n, we can make p tend to infinity and we get what we want. 
and then we have to generalize that to other sets. It's more complicated than in Rykov's theorem because uh, we have to be careful and uh, n should not depend on, uh, I mean, we have to, to keep the control on n even when p is tending to infinity. So we have to, to work on that, but it works. And uh, there was, I still have five minutes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, there was a previous result um, uh, in this context by Bilou, and I would really like to quote it because it's uh, not well known, and that's a very nice paper. Um, he proved that uh, actually we have exactly wh what we want. If we have a doubling constant less than three in uh, the torus, then uh, we can prove that there exists an integral n such that um, and i is included in i, and uh, okay, here it's with i, which is not uh, b, so uh, there's a general setting in this context. The, so, the only problem is that um, he has to take a very small, and it doesn't work uh, if you take a large a. And I will uh, say a few words about the proof, because maybe it's uh, closer to what most of the people here are used to use in their work. Um, so if you assume that uh, I, I take A equal B, so mu of A is uh, less than one and less than three times mu of, mu of A, mu of A plus A, sorry. Uh, we introduce a set of integers here with a rational theta. And so because of uh, Weil's theorem, uh, we know that uh, um, the behavior of B is not very far from the behavior of A. Okay, we have a uniform distribution, and so we can say things about uh, this set. And we can prove that if A has a small doubling constant, then B must also have a small doubling constant. But this time, you're working with a subset of Z. And so you can use Riemann's theorem, Riemann's inverse theorem in Z rather than uh, uh, a theorem in the, in the continuous setting, sorry. Uh, so we use uh, this theorem that I don't state here. It, it says that if you have a small doubling constant, then uh, your set is a subset of a generalized arithmetic progression. And thanks to that, you can prove that there exists an integer n such that n a is included in a small interval. And the smallness of this interval depends on the smallness of a. And once you have that, you ensure that mu of a is so small that the interval i has diameter less than one half. And if the diameter is less than one half, then you don't turn. Meaning that instead of considering your sum as a sum modulo one, you can <coughs> consider your sum as a sum in real numbers. And then you can use uh, results that you, you have in, in real numbers. This is called rectification. You have something which is so small that you can put it in a box so that you don't turn. And if you don't turn, you can use the results in R rather than in T, which are much better. Okay, so um, Ruja, uh, uh, sorry, that's not Ruja, that's Bilou, sorry. Bilou was using uh, uh, a discretization and uh, then he was using the 3K minus four theorem in Z, but uh, we could do that directly with uh, uh, continuous result. Okay, um, and I will, okay, we saw that uh, if we have a result in T, we can transfer it in a result in R. So now that we have a result in T for small sets or for sets of very small doubling, we can hope for a better result in R, okay? And that's why we try to, to do. So uh, there was a previous result by Eberhard, Green, and Manners, and they proved that if the merge of, they were working with A minus A, but it doesn't change much, so it should work also with uh, A plus A. If the merge of A minus A is uh, less than four times the merge of A, then we can find an interval which is not too small, but that was not effective, such that uh, the measure of A, uh, the density of A on this interval is larger than one half. And with uh, Pablo Candela, we proved that uh, uh, if you have a very small doubling constant, so that's not four, that's something which is much smaller. If you have a very small doubling constant 
close to free, uh, then uh, you can prove that there exists an integer n such that n a is included in i and the size of i is at most 1 plus c times the, si the size of a. Okay, and if I translate that so that it looks like uh, Eberhard Green and Minus theorem, it means that uh, if you take uh, epsilon here large enough, then you get an interval with an explicit lower bound for the size of it in the interval on which the density of A is larger than one half. But it only works if you have a very small doubling constant, so we are not in four, it's, it's weaker in this way, much weaker. And uh, just a few words about the, the proof. As you saw, it's very easy to see that if lambda of A plus A is strictly less than three plus C times lambda of A, it means that if you look at the sum A plus A modulo the diameter, let's say that the diameter is one, so modulo one, we have two plus C as a doubling constant at most, okay? And so you can use the result you have in V. The real problem is that now you have to bound the size of, I, uh, I mean, you have to bound N to be able to say that uh, the um, density is not too small, okay? And uh, if you work only modulo one, you will never be able to get a bound for N because uh, you can take as many small intervals and uh, whatever the size of n is, it does not change the size of uh, a plus a module one, okay? But uh, if you're working with real numbers, it means that uh, the size of elements that are in a plus a and such that if you had one, you're still in a plus a is pretty small too. And you have to use that to get an upper bound for n and that's what we did. And so I'll finish here. Thank you.